Price, that's the number one technical indicator. You do best by investing for the longer term. If you can't explain what the business is doing, then that is a huge red flag. Some technological change is going to put you out of business. It really is a genuinely extraordinary situation. Hello, everyone. I'm Ed Gotham, and welcome to Opto Sessions, where we interview the top traders and investors from around the world uncovering their secrets to success. Today, I welcome Matt Hogan, the Chief Investment Officer at Bitwise Asset Management, which has created the world's largest crypto index fund. Bitwise is the leading provider of rules-based exposure to the crypto asset space, with a selection of very interesting crypto funds, and even a recently launched ETF, Bitwise Crypto Industry Innovators, ticker BitQ, B-I-T-Q, which we actually discuss on the show. Prior to working at Bitwise, Matt was CEO of ETF.com and helped spearhead the ETF industry to the mammoth size it's become today. On the show, we discuss the future of crypto, innovative use cases in DeFi, that's decentralized finance, why an index-based approach might be right for you for crypto, and also direct index investing. Matt's a great guest on the show, so I hope you enjoy. Hi, Matt. Great to have you on the show. Hey, Ed. Thanks for having me. Uh, how's everything going there? Everything's great. Uh, another day in the markets. I hear um, US has started to open up is it a little bit. People are traveling a bit more now. They've re- relaxed to quite a few of the rules. That's exactly right. Yeah, vaccinations are, are getting up the curve. Uh, I actually have a business trip planned oh, wow. to go have dinner with some people, which is a, uh, a thing I haven't done in over a year. So uh, it's exciting to finally see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. That's awesome. And you're based near San Francisco, you said? That's right. Yeah, just outside of San Francisco in Berkeley, California. Where's Bitwise um, the headquarters at then? Are you, do you travel in for that or are you all sort of working from home still? Yeah, I'm still working from home. Our office is in San Francisco, but none of us has been to it in over a year. So eventually we'll get back there. I would, I'd expect in the next few months. But uh, for now, working in, in my house with my three kids and my dog and seven chickens. Awesome. <laughs> is that right? Seven chickens. It's outside in the garden. That's right. Outside in the garden, fresh eggs every morning. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> That's brilliant. I thought um, we could kick off the conversation on something that, that I, I imagine a lot of people are thinking about is crypto and um, basically about what the future of crypto is from where we see it now. Obviously, it's a really hard thing to be specific on because we're so early in the adoption of this new technology, which is part of the reason it's so exciting. Uh, but also has its risks, obviously, because there's a lot of things probably won't. Uh, there's a lot of different coins around. Not all of them are going to uh, become useful and used in the future. They can't possibly all be there. So what, what do you think is the future of crypto? And what are the main value areas that you see now that will you know, last for the future? <laughs> it's such a great question. I think you can get lost if you focus on any individual crypto asset and try to project with specificity where the market is going. But if you abstract back to out, And you think about what do crypto enabled blockchains allow that wasn't allowed before the creation of the Bitcoin blockchain and the first publication of the Bitcoin white paper. And it's really three things. So one thing they allow is they allow money to move at internet speeds. You know, we don't think about it much, but money is one of the slowest moving goods in the world right now. We can do a a free video call from me to someone in Kuala Lumpur. We can watch any movie that's ever been created, read any book that's ever been created, you know, scan uh, a million media sites. But if we want to send $10,000 to London, it takes a couple days from here in Berkeley to get there. Uh, one thing crypto does, it allows money to move at internet speeds. The other things that it does, it allows you to program money like software. That's a really big idea. Think about the implications of being able to program money like you would program a traditional computer program. And the third thing it does, it creates digital property rights. Before the Bitcoin blockchain, you couldn't own a digital good without that ownership being blessed by a third party. The Bitcoin blockchain and subsequent crypto blockchains allow you to own digital goods in the same way that you own physical goods. So three main benefits, money moves at internet speeds, you can program money and you create digital property rights What I think that means for where it's going, uh, I think there are things that crypto will certainly enable in the future and things that it may enable in the future. Things that it will certainly enable 
I think Bitcoin as digital gold is a virtual certainty. Individuals will want to store some amount of wealth in a non-sovereign store of value. Bitcoin probably has the lock on that market, and that's a very big market. I think programmable money, self-driving banks, decentralized finance has a chance of disrupting the traditional financial industry in the same way that software and automation disrupted almost every other industry uh, in the world. And then I think the landscape, when you move money on the internet, the things you can do with that when money can ping pong around at extraordinary speeds, um, that's a really wide landscape as well. Think about what happened when we moved text onto the internet with email. It wasn't just we could send letters faster. We suddenly sent short messages, uh, sent emails, sent documents, created media sites, allowed celebrities to talk to us directly over Twitter. Um, it's a really big landscape. So a big picture, uh, I think it's going to disrupt the financial market in the same way that the internet disrupted so many other markets. But you know, the specifics, I guess we'll, we'll have to wait to see. And today, um, following on from this, what What's the case for crypto in someone's portfolio from a retail you know, individual's perspective, if you have an opinion on that? Absolutely. Uh, it's, it combines a couple things that are hard to find in any individual asset. It combines high potential returns. It's certainly been one of the best performing assets over the last 10 years and low correlations to other assets, meaning it zigs sometimes when the stock and bond markets zag. Now, usually when you're talking about low correlations and high potential returns, you're talking about assets that retail investors can't get exposure to. You're talking about early stage venture capital investments or private equity investments where you basically have to be one of the wealthiest investors in the world to have access to that market. One really exciting thing about crypto is that it lets all investors access an asset that has high potential returns and low correlations. So what is its role in its portfolio? The role in the portfolio for retail investors is the same role that that kind of assets have played for institutional investors and endowments for years, which is you want a relatively small allocation, you want to hold it for a long period of time, and you want to rebalance. And if you do that, historically, it's had a strong positive impact on your risk-adjusted returns. Now, of course, there's a huge number of risks. I'm sure we'll get into it. But what's really exciting is it opens up this alternative investment category to retail investors in a way that it hasn't been opened before. And uh, I think that's an exciting landscape. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. So um, you currently work at, at Bitwise. Could you, I think a lot of people won't, uh, won't know too much detail about what Bitwise is. And it, could you possibly go into detail and Tell us about Bitwise and, and a bit about your career to date, because I know you've had some interesting roles at a number of places. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Bitwise is a specialist crypto asset manager. We're one of the largest and fastest growing crypto asset managers in the world. We manage about a billion and a half in assets. We're best known for having created the world's first and today running the world's largest crypto index fund. So you can think of it as the S&P 500 or the FTSE 100 of crypto. It's called the Bitwise 10. It holds the 10 largest crypto assets weighted by market capitalization. And it's been successful with investors who want to make a bet that crypto will be more important in the future than it is today, but don't want to try to pick and choose the winners. These are investors who remember what MySpace was before Facebook came along, or remember what Yahoo was before Google came along. And they just want exposure to the category. And so Bitwise created that fund. We followed it up with other index products. We created the first DeFi index fund. And we're working on other ways to make crypto accessible to traditional investors. Mm -hmm. Now, my own background, I come from a traditional finance world, right? So I came from the ETF industry. I was the CEO of ETF.com, created the world's first ETF rating system, the world's largest ETF conference, the world's largest ETF media site, uh, and ran that business for over a decade, uh, joined the ETF industry, if you want to think of it that way, back when ETFs were relatively small, when people were relatively skeptical of them, when there were media stories about ETFs being weapons of mass destruction or uh, harming the economy. 
and saw that industry grow into you know, a $7 trillion industry. ETFs today are the primary way that investors gain exposure to the market. Uh, and watching crypto do something very similar, which is moving from something that people are skeptical of, people don't really understand, people have a large degree of doubt about, into something that's much more mainstream. Uh, and I see a lot of parallels between the journey that ETFs took and the journey that crypto is is taking today. Yeah, it's very interesting, actually. I hadn't, um, obviously, not many people have, have sort of experienced it such as yourself, but to sort of know that ETFs had these difficulties as well when they started. Any any new thing, just like the adoption curve, it takes time. There's a lot of people that are critical of it. I imagine all these news stories were going around at that time that, you know, ETFs were, were bad and or, and then you get the good ones as well, obviously. But um, it's interesting to see how, you know, you get a lot of the sim- similarities now. Um, it's, it, it's so true. And no one talks about it anymore in the ETF industry. But, uh, you know, I live in the States. Uh, Congress pulled a bunch of ETF executives up in front to testify about whether ETFs were destroying the American entrepreneurial dream. Wow. I mean, they really were vilified in certain circles. I think anytime something new emerges out of nothing and grows very quickly, there is an old guard that is skeptical, that is reactionary, and that is dismissive. And it's only the passage of time, high quality uh, education, and you know, sort of slow and steady growth that allows people to come to grips with what something really is. And so, yeah, it's fascinating People forget it about it now because ETFs are like the mother's milk of investing, but people were very skeptical of them in the early days. And there really are a lot of analogies uh, to the crypto market. Yeah. And what specifically in that journey made you get like realize the potential of crypto and make that jump from an industry that had you know, become hugely successful, I imagine, by the time you sort of left? Yeah. You know, I think almost everyone who moves from the traditional finance industry into the crypto industry has one person or a couple of people that makes them stop, pause, and consider crypto from a more serious perspective. I'll admit, early in in Bitcoin's development, early in crypto's development, I was as dismissive as the next person. It's not like the first time I heard the word Bitcoin, I was immediately converted and saw what the future could be. Uh, In my case, you know, there was a, a, a famous ETF lawyer named Kathleen Moriarty, And Kathleen Moriarty is well known in ETF land because she was the lawyer on the very first ETF in the US, SPY. And she was working with the Winklevoss twins when they uh, were applying for a Bitcoin ETF in 2013. I've known Kathleen for a long time. She's one of the smartest people in the world. And she stopped me and said, Matt, you actually have to think about this crypto stuff. It's a lot more interesting than it's being reported on in the media. And I, so I, I, I credit Kathleen with making me pause and start to take it more seriously. Uh, and so, you know, uh, that, that interest began in, in, in 2013 and I followed it for a number of years. And when I was fortunate enough to sell ETF.com and look around for the next big industry to focus on, uh, crypto was a natural place because again, I saw this space that had enormous potential where the fundamental technological breakthrough sort of could not be denied, uh, but where there was a great deal of skepticism and a lack of understanding. And I thought maybe I could make a small difference in this space as I, as I did in the ETF space. Yeah. Really good time to talk about your new ETF then. (laughs) Um, The Bitwise Crypto Industry Innovators ETF, which I I believe is released a week ago or something like this. Maybe I'm a bit out with that, Uh, but um, could you give us, some details about what, what it is, why people should be interested, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it came out last week, the Bitwise Crypto Innovators ETF. It's the first pure play crypto equity ETF in the US. So it holds the companies that are the picks and shovels or the infrastructure play uh, on the crypto economy. These are things like uh, crypto mining companies, crypto mining equipment manufacturers, crypto brokerages and custodians like Coinbase. Coinbase is the largest single holding in the fund. Uh, These are the companies that build the services and and execute the technologies that allow the crypto industry to thrive. We've really built it for two reasons. On the one hand, there are a large number of U.S. investors who want exposure to Bitcoin and crypto, but we don't yet have a Bitcoin or crypto ETF 
in the US. And so they find a hard time gaining exposure. And for those investors, this picks and shovels play packaged in a global equity ETF that they can buy in their brokerage account makes it easy to get exposure to the, the overall growth of the crypto industry. And so that's that's one thing that's interesting about it. But the other thing that's interesting about it, Ed, and this is perhaps more exciting thing, is that these are just phenomenal companies. Yeah. If you look at a company like Coinbase, uh, it's doing two things that are really rarely put together. It has enormously high revenue growth, right? Revenue growth over the last year at Coinbase is up 1,000% one of the fastest growing large cap companies in the world. And yet, it's already profitable and significantly profitable. I think net income in Q1 was over $700 million. When we think of technology style growth, we think of like Amazon in its early days or Google in its early days when it was burning through cash, but posting enormous revenue growth. One of the really interesting things about these crypto infrastructure plays is they have that kind of growth profile but they're doing it while being extremely profitable. And so regardless of whether you wanted to gain exposure to Bitcoin, Ethereum, or, or other crypto assets, these are just really exciting, disruptive, innovative companies with significant growth and profitability. And it's hard to put those together, to hard to find those. And so our new ETF, BITQ, uh, holds a package of, of 30 of those companies, and we're pretty excited about it. Yeah, it looks very interesting. Something that I was um, looking into it uh, quite a bit um, was you know, some of these coins, um, at least for me, it's difficult to see some of the value behind some of these coins. How are these coins valued? Like, I, can, I can see you know, Bitcoin, digital gold, you can see this because of the scarcity, et cetera, how that uh, has value if it does play out as people perceive it will, will do. Um, but when you compare it to you know, looking at some of these companies that actually you know, even though they might use these coins, they're making money from, you know, a useful way of doing it. It's, it's a very interesting play on it, if you see what I mean. Like, it, it could even be more valuable some, than some other things that are, that are going on at the moment. A hundred percent. Yeah, for one, for most investors, just being back in a world of cash flows, revenues, profits, debt, that's a world that a lot of investors are comfortable in. So it's more approachable in that perspective. And you're right, it's also just an interesting analogy. I mean, you think about what's going on in the market right now. These are volatile times for crypto assets, right? You have Elon Musk tweeting about Bitcoin. You have prices pulling back. Um, a standalone exposure to Bitcoin may be down significantly uh, you know, over this particular time period. But if you, if you pivot to focus on a company like Coinbase, they actually make money from trading activity. So volatile markets are not necessarily a bad thing for Coinbase, as long as there's high interest in mm -hmm. the space. So I, I do think they have this interesting return profile. I think there's some really exciting companies and uh, most people are overlooking them because they've been overlooking crypto. Uh, and so that's a unique opportunity as well. Yeah, yeah I think it's really interesting. Uh, even, even as part of a wider portfolio where you might hold some assets um, that are you know, coins like Bitcoin, et cetera. My next question on that was actually was um what criteria do you use to sort of select these companies and, and weight them in, in the portfolio how is that all done oh i love this question i spent a decade editing the journal of indexes so index specific questions are my favorite things um you know what we were really trying to build a pure play exposure to the crypto equity market and so the rules are designed to do that 85 percent of the index at every rebalance is focused on pure plays in the crypto market. These are companies that derive at least 75% of their revenue from the crypto industry or have 75% of their treasury assets invested in Bitcoin, Ethereum, or another liquid crypto asset. There's then 15% of the portfolio that holds diversified businesses like PayPal and Square that have broader businesses but have an important business line focused on the crypto space. So by far the majority of the portfolio is focused on these pure plays. And then the other interesting rule that we have is we have what's called a fast entry rule for new large IPOs, which is that new IPOs can enter the index at their full weight one day after their initial public offering. So Coinbase went public on April 14th. It entered the index at the close of April the 15th. On April the 16th, it was the largest single position in the index. And we did that because the crypto market is fairly unique 
in that some of the largest companies are still private. Coinbase was a great example, but behind Coinbase, there are companies like Kraken, companies like Bitmain, uh, companies like Gemini, which in many cases are larger than most of the other public equities. And so the index is designed to add these companies shortly after their IPO mm -hmm. so that it, it maintains real fidelity to the state of the publicly traded crypto equity market. So those are the key rules, 85-15, 85% pure play, 15% supporting companies, and then a rule that allows new IPOs to enter the index rapidly. And can I just ask about that one day rule? Is that because typically IPOs are extremely volatile in that first day and they sort of almost e even out the sort of supply and demand on that day? Or is there any, no other reason for that? There are two reasons for it. One is what you said, which is the first day of trading. People are just figuring out what this IPO is and trying to get their hands around it. And so the prices can be very volatile. Uh, and the other reason is from an index and portfolio management perspective, you need that first day of trading to figure out what its appropriate weight would be in the portfolio. So uh, we, we like that. We don't add them before the IPO. You, you sort of have to be an actively managed fund to do that. Uh, we're just trying to represent the market. But yeah, it doesn't bother me that we wait one day to let the market find its footing. Uh, that seems pretty sensible. Mm -hmm. And am I right in saying it's rebalanced every quarter? Is that right? That's exactly right. Rebalanced every quarter, uh, unless there's a special event that requires a, an interstitial rebalancing. But under almost all circumstances, it's rebalanced every quarter. And do you reweight at that point around certain criteria or? That's exactly right. So the pure play section of the sleeve, that 85%, the real focus of the portfolio is market cap weighted, which means the largest companies get the largest weights. There are some adjustments to that market cap weighting, however, to satisfy a variety of rules. So for instance, the largest single constituent is capped at 10%. So the portfolio doesn't become you know, 40, 50% Coinbase. Yeah. Uh, and there's some diversification rules that align with USITs uh, and RIC compliance rules uh, in, in Europe and the US. But generally speaking, it's a market cap weighted portfolio. And you see that because the largest company in the space, Coinbase, is the largest, uh, largest entity in the index. Behind the sort of capping at 10%, is that something you've thought over you know, your time of ETFs and everything? Is that something you've got from some data that you've like, um, maybe there's some ETFs you've seen that get too weighted in one area? Yeah. <laughs> It's so true. There are a number of actually country-specific ETFs that can get very concentrated. So the Netherlands is an example where Heineken, I believe the beer company there, is a huge portion of that local market. And without capping rules in place, it would absolutely dominate an ETF. So anytime you have sort of a power law skew in market capitalization distribution, you often have a capping rule that prevents any single constituent from over dominating the index. So yeah, that 10% cap is, is sort of pulled from historical best practices for concentrated markets. And to put yeah. it in context, Coinbase came public at a $60 billion valuation. The next largest constituent is $6 billion. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you need that sort of capping rule in order to ensure that it's appropriately diversified. You still want concentrated holdings in those very important stocks, but you don't want yeah an ETF to become a proxy for a single company. Yeah. And you obviously got a lot of other uh, private funds, I think. That's the only ETF you have at the moment is the, the pure play picks and shovels, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. All the other funds are private funds available for accredited investors. And could we just roll through some of those now? Um, so obviously, I think the 10 crypto index fund, was that your first one? That was the first one launched in 2017. Today, it's about a, a billion dollar plus fund. Uh, it holds the 10 largest crypto assets. It rebalances monthly. Mm -hmm. The crypto asset market moves very quickly. So it's designed to keep up pace uh, by rebalancing monthly. But yeah, it's the S&P 500 or the FTSE 100 of crypto. Got you. And why should people be interested in this index fund over you know, just going all, all in on Bitcoin? Or uh, you know, why is an index approach superior? Yeah. Uh, two, two reasons. One, as I mentioned earlier, we don't know how this market's going to turn out. This is a disruptive, new, early area of the market. And anyone who tells you they have a perfect forecast of exactly which asset's going to win 
uh, is, is overconfident and not telling you the truth. I'm in this market 24-7, 365, and the vast majority of my money is in our index fund. Why? Because I have a high degree of confidence in crypto's future, uh, but I know that picking and choosing the winners is going to be difficult. The other thing I would say is people should understand that different crypto assets aren't like different currencies. I think a lot of people get confused imagining that Bitcoin and Ethereum are like the dollar and the pound. Uh, and it seems like those would be largely fungible. And in an internet enabled world, only one of those will win. A better analogy is to think of Bitcoin and Ethereum like two competing software companies, maybe Microsoft and Salesforce. Microsoft and Salesforce are both great companies, but they're optimized to do different things, right? We use Microsoft for word processing. We use Salesforce to manage our CRM. Both software companies, both using the same kind of core underlying technological capabilities, but for completely different purposes. And I think it's, it's little known, but in the crypto market, the same thing is true. So Bitcoin as a, uh, a blockchain database optimized really to serve as digital gold. It's got a limited programming interface. It's really good at storing wealth. It's not good at much else. Ethereum is optimized to serve that second use case we mentioned at the top of this show, programmable money. It's a much more flexible database than Bitcoin. It's probably less secure. So it's probably less good at being digital gold, more good at being the rails of a new internet of money. There's so much you can do with crypto-enabled blockchains. The, the landscape is so large that the future is unlikely to be true that one asset will dominate the entire space. Maybe that's true, but unlikely. More likely, I think you're going to see a handful of assets that are optimized for different things, each of which thriving in its own ways, in the same way we see in any other sort of software or technology area of the market. So an index-based approach lets you make a bet on the whole space, the whole idea of crypto-enabled blockchains and moving money over the internet and all of the different things that could mean without concentrating your bets and trying to pick any one winner. And you also offer uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, private funds. That's right. I had a question about this. Do you think um, probably uh, the use case for them is people who want to get more concentrated exposure to those uh, specifically if they believe in them? Or, you know, if they want to get more, uh, more concentration than those, then the 10 sort of crypto index fund, they want, you know, higher, higher concentration of Bitcoin or something. Do you think a Bitcoin ETF or Ethereum ETF, if approved, because they, they, as you mentioned earlier, they're not, they're not there yet, will sort of contribute significantly to the success potentially of, of crypto as an area? Is it, is it that fundamentally important? It is that fundamentally important. And it's that fundamentally important for two primary reasons. The first is, and this doesn't get talked about enough, uh, a Bitcoin and Ethereum and or Ethereum ETF, let's focus on a Bitcoin ETF, will collapse the costs for accessing Bitcoin. Today, investors around the world, but particularly in the US, still pay significantly high fees to access the Bitcoin space. And we all know that the ETF landscape is a space where fees compress dramatically. So one thing a Bitcoin ETF will do is just make it significantly cheaper for investors to gain exposure to Bitcoin, and that will be a good thing. But the second thing it will do is it'll bring a whole new class of investors into the crypto market. Uh, in the US, at least, most of the investable wealth is not held by self-directed retail investors, by investors who are going into their Schwab accounts and managing their own assets. Most is directed by financial advisors or, or IFAs or RIAs or broker dealers. They go by a bunch of different names. And these people, uh, they aren't going to invest in crypto through a, an, an app on your phone. They will invest in crypto if there were a well-regulated, well-developed mm -hmm. ETF because it fits into their workflow. So crypto will open up a significant portion of the US market, or an ETF will open up a significant portion of the US market to crypto for the first time ever. And the, the reason that's important, the reason it's not just a nice to have, is that the onboarding of new capital into an asset like Bitcoin and the development of a broader liquidity ecosystem actually makes Bitcoin better. It makes it yeah. more secure, more liquid, better understood, more regulated. All of these things make it more likely to succeed in the future. There's a 
positive reflexive loop here. And so uh, I think it will be a major milestone when we get a Bitcoin ETF in the US. And I do think we'll get one. I don't know if it will be this year. I don't know if it will be next year, but I do think we'll get one eventually. Mm. That was my next question. You know, what do you see it happening this year? I imagine Bitwise is interested in you know, this sort of area, ETFs for, for <laughs> Bitcoin and stuff. So why do you think um, the US uh, regulators or whatever, why are they stopping the, you know, because there's been lots of applications for ETFs for a long time. I mean, you mentioned even back in 2013 that the mm-hmm. Binkovos twins were trying to do it, like, but we still haven't got there. What hurdles have they got to get over? Yeah, well, fewer than they had in 2013. Look, I am in the crypto industry and I love ETFs, but in 2013, the market wasn't ready for a Bitcoin ETF. There were no institutional custodians in the market. There were arbitrage gaps, liquidity concerns. There were audit concerns. We have many fewer issues today. The primary issues that the SEC is wrestling with in the US are focused on concerns around market manipulation and whether the underlying spot markets for Bitcoin are sufficiently regulated or sufficiently supported by regulated derivatives market to allow for a fair market in Bitcoin. And, you know, those are good questions to ask. Now, if you ask me, I think absolutely uh, they are. And I think the success we've seen overseas uh, with ETFs in Canada, in Switzerland, uh, in Europe, in Brazil, shows that you can have an ETF that helps investors get successful exposure to this market. But the SEC has been asking questions, and it's it's not that bad that they're moving slow. They're pushing the market in a positive direction, and we'll get there eventually. But you're absolutely right. Bitwise is keenly focused on this. Uh, We're working on it around the clock. Uh, We have multiple people doing research, and I hope that we get there eventually. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. So my next uh, interest area I think we'd like to dig into is the DeFi, basically, which has sort of come around as one of the interesting use cases from crypto where you can clearly see there's some value happening um, and you know revenues for companies involved with it. I think there's a lot of people that don't truly understand what it is. And are you, are you able to go into what, what is DeFi because you've got a DeFi fund and um, why it has value? This is my favorite question because this is an area of the market that is exploding right now. As you said, it has real use, real revenues, real growth. Uh, and yet most people in the mainstream media or in traditional finance aren't talking about it. What DeFi is, is that second use case that I talked about, the ability to program money to automate services that traditional financial services have provided for years. If you think about something like going to a bank and asking for a loan, the bank doesn't look at you and evaluate the squareness of your jaw and how nice your clothes are. They look you up in a database, see what your credit score is, see what your income is, see what your collateral is, and decide whether or not to give you a loan. Well, all of that can be done automatically with software. All of that can be done in a decentralized fashion. And so what DeFi is, big picture, is this this new landscape of decentralized financial services that use software and automation to provide traditional financial services at a fraction of the cost with more openness and more efficiency. It's disrupting the traditional financial market in a way that software is disrupted other markets like retail, like, uh, like TV, uh, like the postal service. Now, the, the funny thing about DeFi is when I say these words to people, people imagine that I'm talking about you know, 2030 or something far off in the future, that this is a sort of Jetsons era dream. And the really interesting thing about DeFi, the really reason it's exciting is that's not the case. It's very real. So to give you an example, The largest single DeFi asset today is an asset called Uniswap. Uniswap is a decentralized exchange. It does the same thing that Coinbase does. If you go to Uniswap with Bitcoin, you can trade it for Ethereum. If you go with Ethereum, you can trade it into a number of other assets. So it's competing directly with Coinbase, which obviously has built an enormously successful business. But here's the amazing thing. Last month, uh, there was $50 billion of trading volume on Uniswap. 
and it generated $250 million in fees. And it's that last piece that often gets traditional investors. These are software programs that are generating hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue because they're finding real use among crypto investors. Now it's early, it's risky, it's still developing. A lot of it is still only inside the crypto industry, but the proof of concept is there. And I think the number of people talking about DeFi is going to rise exponentially over the course of the next year. Yeah. Do you think if it's successful, obviously, that they'll take over things such as you know, mortgages, personal loans, business loans, all these things could be offered through crypto in some way? Yes. I think there's a manifest destiny to decentralized finance. If you look at the share of global GDP that traditional financial services has eaten up, uh, it's risen from about 2% in the 1940s to 6 or 7 or 8% today. It's moved monotonically up and to the right. Uh, that's a telltale sign of an industry that's dying for disruption. I, it, is, it is absurd to me today, the, the fees that we pay for people to provide simple sort of if-then statements mm. with some trust. Think about an escrow agent. All an escrow agent does is sit in the middle of a financial transaction and wait for one person to upload you know, a million dollars and someone else to upload the deed to a house and then cross that transaction. And we regularly get charged $500 or $1,000 for escrow services when we buy homes. That's ridiculous. You know, my, my 14-year-old daughter could program that into a yeah. smart contract and it would work just fine. It's just an if-then statement. Uh, all of that, I believe, will eventually be disrupted in some form by decentralized finance. Now, exactly how long that takes and exactly the form it takes depends on a lot of things, including progress in regulation. There's not a clean path from here to that future. But will financial services in the future be uh, automated through software instead of you know, wet ink signatures and high-paid lawyers and fancy suits? Uh, absolutely. I can't imagine a future where that's not true. Yeah. And the main, the main reason why it would be more successful is because you're essentially cutting out the middleman. So fees should be lower. Fees will be lower. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Look, once you move money, if you think of crypto big picture as taking money out of the physical world and moving it to the internet world, all the things you can do once money is in the internet world uh, become available to you. Mm. And so the fees will drop, not by a little, they'll drop by, you know, 90%. I mean, it's just much more efficient once you can program money like software. The fees should fall exponentially. And so you've obviously got a DeFi fund. Are you able to take us through uh, a few of the most interesting tokens? That I mean, you mentioned Uniswap already, so maybe a few of the other ones that you think have got promise. Absolutely, I'd love to. Yeah, it's, it's a market cap weighted index fund of the leading DeFi apps. So Uniswap is the largest. The second largest one is Aave. Uh, if you think of Uniswap as a decentralized exchange, Aave is a decentralized lending program. If you take one crypto asset onto Aave, you can get a loan in another crypto asset uh, instantaneously, which is different from the traditional financial system. And Aave is doing you know, fairly regularly very large loans, $100 million loans, et cetera. Uh, as you move down the space, you get into uh, other assets like Yearn, that are doing things that are more akin to asset management and searching out yields. You get things like synthetics, which you can conceptualize as a decentralized derivatives exchange, allowing, uh, allowing for the creation and trading of decentralized derivative contracts. More or less, if you think about a traditional financial service that's provided by a major bank, you can imagine it being delivered in a decentralized fashion. Right now, there's not an asset that's focused on the insurance space, but there's some small cap DeFi assets that may enter the index that focus on insurance as well. So really, any traditional financial services, uh, there, there's probably a DeFi application that's thinking about how to do that through yeah. software and automation. Uh, and the index is designed to capture the 10 most successful of, of those assets. Yeah. And do you think, um, in your opinion, what actually, what is the... So an innovation that we're close to in DeFi that's most interesting to you that doesn't already exist in your portfolio? You think insurance is it or 
I think insurance is it. One of the things that people talk about when they talk about DeFi is that you're replacing traditional financial services with code, uh, which is very exciting. But one of the services that traditional finance provides is sort of protection and certainty, right? If someone steals your debit card and charges, you know, a thousand dollars on it, your bank will make you whole. If you mess up your mortgage statement, your bank is not going to steal your house. Once you replace that sort of hands-on service with code, you have more risk. If there's an error in the code, people can steal money. Uh, if there's an error in the contract, it could turn out not like you want. So I think there's a new and growing market of people providing insurance on the kind of smart contracts or software programs that power decentralized finance. And I think some people will uh, decide that they want to pay that insurance as a way of having uh, certainty and safety when they're making large financial decisions. And so over the next three to five years or so, if crypto space as a whole, do you um, do you feel like it's going to be very volatile over the next? It's still going, you know, as it, we're relatively we, well, we are early in the, in sort of innovation and the adoption curve. Obviously, with more success, it should stabilize a bit. But however, maybe not in the next three to five years. Do you have an opinion on that? I think it'll stabilize a bit. It'll still be volatile, but it'll stabilize a bit. The stabilizing piece is, I think, a lot of the binary risk has gone out of crypto. Even if you backpedal three or four years, there were still a large number of relatively existential concerns in crypto around regulation, around banking, um, that introduced some some binary risk that the whole thing could fall really significantly. Um, I think that has been modulated by progress and by the widening types of investors involved in the space. So I expect it to still be very volatile. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but I think it'll be less volatile in the next five years than it has been in the past five years. And how do you think crypto today uh, fits into a traditional sort of asset allocation? A great question. I think for investors who are allocating to crypto, the vast majority will be well served by an allocation between 1% and 5% of their portfolio. Below 1%, it's probably not enough for them to pay attention. Above 5%, you start introducing uh, significant increases in downside volatility in your portfolio during crypto's inevitable uh, risk-off pullbacks. And I worry a lot about the behavioral consequence of that. If people see a significant position in their portfolio drawing down 50%, they might panic and sell at the worst time. So constraining your allocation between 1% and 5% allows you to have a significant impact on your risk-adjusted returns without introducing that sort of gut-wrenching behavioral aspect of having too much of your value at risk. So I think that's the right answer for most investors, 1% to 5%. I'm personally more invested in than that, uh, but I have a, a very high conviction on crypto and uh, you know, don't recommend that necessarily for most investors. Yeah. Now, I want to just quickly swing it back to ETFs before we sort of wrap up a bit. Could you tell us about direct index investing? Oh, I love it. You've hit on, hit on one of my other loves. <laughs> um, a, a problem people make in finance and technology in general is always figuring that we're at the end of history. And I think uh, that's a problem that the ETF industry suffers from now. ETFs were a huge innovation over mutual funds. Uh, and people now make the assumption that ETS will forever and always be the way that people gain exposure to the market. I think there's a next thing. And the next thing is direct indexing. The idea behind direct indexing is, look, you as a investor could buy a FTSE 100 ETF or an S&P 500 ETF that holds all 500 companies in the S&P 500 in one easy package. Or you as an investor could have your own portfolio where you have individual positions in each of those names or in a subset of those 500 names. And the beauty of doing it the second way of having a direct personalized index to the S&P 500 is twofold. Uh, one, you can manage the tax consequences of that portfolio better. It has better tax outcomes for most investors. And two, you can personalize it to fit your own individual ESG criteria. The things you care about, you can exclude from that market. The things you want to emphasize, you can add to that market. Direct indexing hasn't been a big deal for most investors because for a long time, there wasn't the technology that allowed it to be easy and the costs were too high. But with commission costs falling to zero, I 
as a you know relatively normal investor can now have the same kind of individualized index-based portfolio that the largest investors in the world used to have for themselves 10 or 15 years ago. Technology has advanced to the point where it's now trivially easy for me to build my own personalized version of the S&P 500. And I think a lot of investors are going to migrate away from broad-based buckets to this more personalized approach, which is probably more tax efficient and possibly lower cost in the long run um, as well. I think it's a massive growth industry. There are a number of great companies. I'm not professionally involved in any of them, but I, I love the space and I think it's going to grow significantly. Yeah, I agree. That's that's really is really interesting. And what what my next question that popped up about that was, yeah, if you created your own index from that top index, potentially you made the wrong decision on a, a, few, a few things. Like, that there is a risk of that, I suppose, as well as choosing the right things and outperforming that index. Um, how do you think people approach that to mitigate that sort of problem? It's a great question. Software and engineering is the answer. So you have to be able to present to people the consequences of their decision. In other words, depending on how far you want to stray away from, let's say, what the S&P 500 actually holds, you may have an outcome that could be you know, X percent better or worse. I got you, yeah. And so people just need to understand that if they want to exclude, let's say, energy, because they're concerned about carbon footprints, that will widen the outcomes and they may trail the index by one, two or 3% a year going forward. So you just have to present people clarity in their options. And look, ultimately, this is not going to be a market where a million people have a million different portfolios. It's going to be more like when you go to a specialty salad store for lunch, right? You could theoretically build your own salad from the 75 different ingredients that they have. But most people will choose one of the 20 prepared salads or, or pre-designed salads that they recommend. That's going to be the same in investing. It's just going to give you more choice. And then you're going to customize around those choices here and there. But I do think it's the future. I think it's the only way that ESG investing emerges as a real retail-led phenomenon. I think ESG funds will never resonate with retail investors in a meaningful way because you know, Ed, you and you and I probably have different views of exactly what's most important from an ESG perspective. So why shouldn't our portfolios fit those views exactly the way we want? Yep. It's been a really interesting conversation, Matt. I've, I've uh, enjoyed that thoroughly. Um, it'd be interesting to see where developments happen in both direct index investing and crypto. I'm sure people will be following that very closely. Um, I wanted to just wrap up quickly by having a quick fire round. We do this uh, end of most uh, podcasts it's just five questions we're going to ask uh, i'm going to ask that um they're not really needing like a long answer they're just whatever comes to mind mm -hmm. uh look at a quick short sort of like answers yeah so if you have if you're ready to go on that I'll, I'll crack on with the first one i'm ready let's do it um so today what crypto do you believe offers the best sort of risk or reward and why <laughs> i should say my index but i'm really excited about ethereum ethereum is going through a couple of major technological upgrades that will make it more useful and will also shrink the inflationary rate, shrink the amount of new supply. And I think that combination makes it the asset of, of 2021 uh, and potentially of 2022 as well. Your favorite book, and it doesn't have to be one about investing, it can be whatever you, whatever you think. <laughs> Uh, Dave Eggers wrote a book called The Heart A Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius, which, uh, which fundamentally uh, set my life on a certain trajectory. So that's, that's always my go-to answer there. Awesome. An investing hero you follow? Uh, Jack Bogle is a personal hero of mine. He hated crypto for what it's worth, but uh, that doesn't overstate. I think he had a, an enormous impact on the lives of millions of Americans by bringing down the cost of investing. And, and he's a personal yep. hero in more ways than one. An important lesson the market has taught you. Ooh, important lesson the market has taught me is a great question. Uh, don't be overconfident. Don't be overconfident. Don't bet all your, all your bets on one horse. The market is very complex. Uh, I learned the hard way that indexing is a good idea by baking some ridiculous single stock investments early in my life. And um, yeah, don't bet it all on one horse. Mm -hmm. Do you believe in that sort of approach of like un uncorrelated assets or Ray Dalio approach to that? 
Absolutely. Yeah. You want to pack as many uncorrelated assets as you can in your portfolio, particularly right now when we're in a possible phase regime shift where the historical returns of bonds may not be a very good forecast for the future returns of bonds. I think people should be thinking about alternative assets in a broad sense right now and probably increasing their allocation to them. So finally, what's your investing edge? (laughs) Uh, I think I'm willing to, ooh, I would say I'm an optimist. I think that's my investing edge. You know, it's easy to be a pessimist in the world and it's easy to sound smart as a pessimist, but in the long term, optimists tend to be right, particularly about technology. You need to be a skeptical optimist. And I guess the fact that I'm a relatively skeptical optimist has been my historical uh, edge that brought me into ETFs early and and brought me into crypto pretty early as well. Yeah, I think you're spot on there. If you're not an optimist, you're never going to believe in innovation at the time where the potentially the biggest returns are. That's right. Exactly. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Matt. That's been, um, been really good to have you on the show. Um, where can people find you? You know, on Twitter, do you have a blog? Um, obviously, bitwise.com is where they should go to find all your, your instruments. Yeah, bitwiseinvestments.com. You can sign up for our newsletter and uh, we will we'll write a fair amount about the crypto markets. I'm also on Twitter at Matt underscore Hogan. Uh, and Hogan has a, a U in it. So that's Matt underscore H-O-U-G-A-N. But would love to see you all on social media. Amazing. Thanks, Matt. Uh, have a good rest of the day and hope we catch up soon. Thanks for having me, Ed. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during the trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new products, stock reports, or webinars from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. And thanks also to CoFruition for consulting on and producing the show. Until next time.